and I'm not a psychologist, and I'm not a guru, <laughs> um, but happiness is a loaded, complicated word. I, I like to think more in terms of contentedness. Since this is the first episode of the year 2024, I've been waiting for this podcast to happen. You talk about purpose. The question of purpose is the question of why. Why am I working so hard? I'm Rob Walcott, co-founder and chair of the World Innovation Network, or Twin Global. So purpose can be applied in multiple lenses and multiple horizons. When people talk about purposes, they feel like uh, if they're answering this question of purpose, it has to be some sort of extraordinary, uh, philanthropic, uh, altruistic purpose. And, and I, I think that's, in most cases, the wrong way to think about it. The best purposes I find hmm. uh, through my career are purposes that are both selfless, they give something to the world, and are selfish, they give something to you. Earning bread and butter for my family, would that be a purpose? Yeah, a absolutely. Uh, purpose needs to work for you more than anyone else. We as human beings, we are not absolved from issues of ego. And so sometimes the, the answer is, well, I want to do that because I desire to be seen. The notion of purpose can change over time. I'm not one who believes that each individual has one core purpose and all they have to do is discover it and the rest of their lives they'll follow it. No matter how far you've walked in the wrong direction, turn back. What is more important for us to identify, the goals first or the purpose first? Well, I think that's iterative. Now, intellectually, it would make sense to define purpose first. What are your vision? What is your vision in the future? Why is that your vision? That's purpose. Everyone in the universe has a purpose, whether they've thought about it or not. Hey, Robert, finally, I could get you on this podcast. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Of course, Gaurav. Nice to see you too. Such a pleasure. You know what? I've been waiting for this podcast to happen for several reasons. And I wanted this podcast to be the first podcast because I know what we are going to create in this podcast is going to be mind-blowing and is going to provide direction to so many leaders in the world. So super excited and humble. Well, great. Thanks for the opportunity. You you connect to uh, a very interesting group of people around the world. And, and it looks to me like they're complementary to a lot of the people that I connect with. It is. It is. As much as I would want to say that I envy with the kind of people that you connect with. But slowly and steadily, I'll get there. And Robert, you are an author. You are a community builder. You talk about innovation. You talk about purpose. You have been talking about artificial intelligence when even the world was not talking about that. You were talking about deep technologies, exponential technologies, when not many had heard about that. I could get onto any direction, but since this is the first episode of the year 2024, I would like to understand from you and dwell deeper into. A couple of areas. The primary one is I would like to dwell deeper into the purpose. Because while going through the articles that you have written, I found few of your statements quite fascinating. You know, when you mentioned that the best purposes are both selfish and selfless. And there are so many other uh, statements that you have made. That intrigued me. So let's start from the basics. How do you define purpose and why it's important for an individual to have a purpose? I mean, why seek a purpose at all? Right. That's a, a great question, Gaurav. No one's required to seek purpose. And, and I, like you, I know people who seem fairly content and even successful in life who haven't even thought about what is my purpose, my professional purpose, my personal purpose. So it is possible to navigate quite well uh, without having a sense of purpose. Uh, my, our dog here at our family home in Ridgewood, New Jersey, seems to be quite happy. And I'm not sure that she has 
defined a, a purpose other than to make sure that her family is happy and 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 cared for. So um, I think some of it happens naturally, but Gaurav, in a world where technology can increasingly do anything, and I yeah. do mean anything, the critical question for each of us becomes what should we be doing and why? Yeah. And the question of purpose is the question of why. Why am I working so hard? Why am I trying to achieve something? And by the way, Gaurav, when I talk about purpose, I mean everything from what most people think of when the topic of purpose comes up, which is what is my big uh, messianic objective in the world, like saving the whales. And I, and by the way, I love saving whales. I think whales are great. Or, mm -hmm. or, or solving climate change or some of these really big um, epochal issues. Yeah. Uh, anything like that. But I also mean the more day-to-day -day mission objectives. What yeah. are the things I'm trying to accomplish uh, tactically, strategically, uh, near-term, medium-term, long-term? So purpose can be applied in multiple lenses and multiple horizons. Mm. And so um, something that I've noticed when people talk about purpose is they feel like uh, if they're answering this question of purpose, it has to be some sort of extraordinary uh, philanthropic uh, altruistic purpose. And, yeah. and I, I think that's, in most cases, the wrong way to think about it. The, the reason is that if you're going to have an outsized impact in the world, you're going to have to work really hard. If you're going to face adversity and suffer the slings and arrows, there's going to have to be something in it for you to keep you committed. Yeah. And this is why, and I think you're referring to a Forbes article I posted uh, uh, maybe four or five years ago. The best purposes I find mm. uh, through my career and working with students at the Kellogg School of Management and the Booth School of Business and mm. other, other venues it, are purposes that are both selfless, they give something to the world, and are selfish, they mm. give something to you. And I mean this in only uh, the most positive way. Um, the selfless part, most people mm. kind of get that, but they over-index on that. The selfless part, though, does help us personally because there's a lot of research that shows that mm. when you help others, when you have a positive impact in the world, it actually improves your well-being and your sense of, of contribution and self and even contentedness or happiness, though that's another uh, yeah. a whole other issue area. Precisely. But if you're going to work really hard to make big things happen, and mm. there's got to be something in it for you. So that's why uh, this selfish part, I believe, really needs to be part of the mm. equation. Mm -hmm. And the article talks about that it it improves your physical and psychological well-being. And I could so much resonate with that because, you know, it should not always be selfless unless I have something that I would be achieving from this endeavor. I might be running out of fuel, right? Now, Robert, help me understand. As you said it, and I would want to double click on that, you said it that most of us tend to consider that our purpose should be bigger than life. Climate change, saving whales, saving eagles, saving water, saving soil, making sure that we have the right, the green environment all around. Now, help me understand, does it mean that going to my office, earning bread and butter for my family, would that be a purpose? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, purpose needs to work for you more than anyone else. It needs to work for you. The, th the fact is, if it doesn't work for you, then it's not going to work for anyone else. Mm. What you really want to find is, is a purpose that's going to motivate you, that energizes you to go out and create the change you desire to see, mm. create the value to desire to create. And personal purpose for many of us, I have two daughters uh, and my wife and I uh, see it as part of our personal purpose to ensure that they have the opportunities necessary to thrive in this world. How our purpose as parents uh, is to help our family thrive. Mm. Uh, and as probably many of your listeners uh, would, would agree, there are few purposes more important than that for each of us individually. But that's not mutually exclusive to also going out and trying to make change happen in the world at large. Mm. 
And by the way, uh, when I pose this question to my students at the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago, and these are mm. older students, they're 32 to 55 years old. So they're mid-career. Yeah. They've already achieved a level of success that's quite impressive. And I say, I say to them, write an essay up to 800 words. Mm. What is your professional purpose? Mm. Why do you work so hard? And What's interesting, Gaurav, is how many of these students say to me, you know what? No one has ever asked me that question before. Mm. In my entire career, no one's asked me that question. And I turn it back to them in a positive way. And I say, well, but this is a question for you to ask yourself. Mm. That's why we're doing this exercise. And so I tell them, look, if, if your personal pro professional purpose, if you are convinced that your professional purpose is to go out and do something philanthropic and save children or whatever those things are, which are all great, then that's great, write about that. But if you decide your, prof your professional purpose is to build a successful billion dollar company, mm. that's great too. Now make sure, hopefully you're incorporating ethics into that uh, effort to build that billion yeah. dollar business. Yeah. But you know what, when someone creates a billion dollar business, you create jobs, you create, hopefully solve problems for customers, mm -hmm. you create economic value, that mm -hmm. economic value then supports everyone else's ability mm -hmm. to go out and do things like write poetry or mm -hmm. save children mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. et cetera. So, so there's an extraordinary contribution of building economic value. Mm -hmm. And if that's what drives and motivates you at this point in your life, and, and the notion of purpose can change over time. I'm not one who believes that each individual has one core purpose and all they have to do is discover it and the rest of their lives, they'll follow it. That might work for some people, but I've found that mm. people change over time and there are certain objectives and visions and horizons that, that as you get older, as you experience more things, you might shift your notion of purpose. And so this is yeah. an ongoing effort, but, but I tell people you should decide what is going to motivate you to create the greatest impact and positive impact in the world that you can. Yeah. Robert, help me understand. Since we are talking about purpose and I'm just circling it back, when you ask people, what do you do? Why do you do that? What kind of responses you get? Because if I look at life, my own eyes and if i start to ask people what do you do why do you do that my assumption is they would tell you that you know what i would like to take care of my family got it right. um you know i have led a very fearful life and i would like to ensure that my family members my children they don't have to go through what i have gone through now there are certain past patterns we all are suffering from i personally yeah. believe that most of us are born in dysfunctional families mm. What drives us is greed, mm. ego, and power. In order to satiate that need, I do what I do. What has been your experience since you talk to people from diverse background? Yes. What has been your experience? Well, so that's a, a, a big and great question, Gaurav. Remember, I'm not a psychologist. And so I'm not there to psychoanalyze each individual but I do ask them as they explore their own sense of purpose mm. to do an exercise that uh, I've learned from my colleagues over the years. I think it was invented by Socrates and it's probably in the Upanishads too somewhere, but it's the, it's the exercise called five whys. So with five whys, what you do is you say, here's my objective. In this case, my pur purpose. Here's mm. what I think my professional purpose is. So once you've articulated that the first time, then go to a, a friend or a colleague or a loved one, someone whom you trust, and ask them to do this exercise with you. You can do it by mm -hmm. yourself, but it's better to have an interlocutor, someone else to pose the question to you so they can share it back and they can uh, challenge you a little bit in your thinking. And here's how it works. So you state, here's my professional purpose. Then they say to you, why? Why do you believe that's your professional purpose? And then you answer why you believe that's your professional purpose. Mm -hmm. And then after you've answered that, then they say a second time, okay, so why that? Mm -hmm. 
And then you talk about, well, why is that important to me? So it just to oversimplify, it could be, you know, my purpose for the next phase of my career is to build a billion dollar company. Okay, why is that? Well, you know, because I want to take economics off the table in terms of my family, and I want to overcome that and have complete freedom. Why is that? Oh, well, because I suffered greatly and I saw my parents struggling greatly when we were children, and I want to ensure that's never an issue. Well, um, why is that so important to you? And, and once you start to get down, you might also start to uncover, for instance, these issues of ego. Mm. And mm. Uh, mm. Uh, we as human beings, we're not absolved from issues of ego. And so sometimes the the answer is, well, I want to do that because I desire mm. to be seen. I desire to be recognized within my field of uh, of the world as a true leader, as a true yeah. expert. Yeah. Or why is it? Well, because maybe my I didn't receive that from my parents. You know, I mm. I'm just making this up. But again, yeah. I'm not a psychologist. Yeah. But every one of us can do this this exercise without delving into the psychoanalytic yeah. factors yeah. that and say, why do we think that's what we want to do? And one of the things I find, Gaurav, is when people start to do this exercise honestly, that sometimes they find that they're not even on the right path. Yeah. Um, the the every day, for instance, if their current objective is to try and get to the next level on the corporate mm -hmm. hierarchy and they're working really hard to get there and they do this honest exercise, they might discover that that's not even the right direction. And as mm -hmm. I think there's a Turkish proverb, no matter how far you've walked in the wrong direction, turn back. Yeah. And and that this is an exercise that helps you determine if you're even walking in the right direction. Yeah. You know, as I'm just listening to you, Robert, if you ask me, I think what would be left behind for me would be apparent meaninglessness. Oh. Right. And I think it's a great opportunity and my responsibility to create meaning in that apparent meaninglessness. It's a great opportunity, right? From that emptiness, I can create something. Yes. Well, this is this is the uh, as an existentialist or even a nihilist <laughs> might might say that, that what we face is is meaninglessness. Yeah, and it is our job to determine what will we will believe to be meaningful in the yeah. universe. Uh, now, depending on your faith and your background, you might disagree with this. But if we take those factors out, then then the universe does become meaningless. I love the book by Camus. Uh, the myth of Sisyphus, mm. and if 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 you haven't read it, I, I highly recommend you read it, and you'll probably mm. end up reading it a second or third time to get it. But at the end, was, uh, what Camus is describing is he's 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 describing this myth of Sisyphus, who is this mm. individual in Greek mythology who every morning gets up and pushes a boulder up to the top of a hill, mm. and in the evening the boulder rolls back down again. And every mm. morning he gets back up to do the same thing again, mm. Mm. Uh, which could be the very definition of meaninglessness. Yeah. But at the end of Camus' book, he asserts in much more beautiful prose than I can repeat here, but he asserts that it is Sisyphus's decision that this is meaningful. And, and this is the quandary that we all face in our lives. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, as I'm just listening to you, I'm just wondering if I know I'm going to lead a happy life once I've been able to live a purposeful life, what is coming in my way and why am I creating sufferings for myself? Now, that's a question which is coming to me. Before I yeah. get that, you spoke about your dog. Yes. And you said that she's always happy. Well, I, I want to challenge the notion of happiness. I, I want to be careful with that word. And again, I'm not a psychologist. Mm. And I'm not a guru. <laughs> um, but uh, happiness is a loaded, complicated word. I, I like to think yeah. more in terms of contentedness. Contentedness, yeah. Um, but our, our dog is not necessarily always happy, but she's always eager. It's contented, yeah. And yeah. she's always focused on our well-being. Mm. And when everybody's together and everybody seems well, she's uh, completely content. And when yeah. we're not, she's 
focused on trying to bring us all back together and make sure everybody's content. Let me ask you, can I live a contented, a fulfilled life, even if I don't have the purpose, the way society would expect me to define purpose? You know, because you're talking about just pushing it on the top of the mountain and the boulder will come down again. According to him, that's purpose. Well, in, in the myth, he was in the myth he was doomed to do that. So that mm. that's a different factor. Um, but you know, again, I'm I'm not a psychologist, so uh, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, but sure, you can have a very happy, contented life mm. without having a, a sense of professional purpose. In fact, yeah, uh, there are whole thought systems, religions, one might call uh, like Buddhism, for instance, where part of it is uh, overcoming attachments, overcoming mm. desires and Sufferings. being wholly uh, content with whatever the world is as it currently is yeah. and to, yeah. to overcome all of that. So that's sort of anathema in a way yeah. to the notion of finding purpose. But I believe that, and I and I have great respect and love for those thought systems and 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 religious uh, traditions. Um, I've learned quite a bit from it, and will hopefully, God willing, will continue to do so the rest of my life. But I I believe there's also an active role to play in the world, and that's a choice. This is an opportunity we have, but we're not required to take it. And so mm. what, what I would propose is to be proactive and take the initiative to envision the life you desire to live yeah, and ask the question at the same time, why am I striving to do so? Yeah. By the way, if you decide, you know what, I've been blessed, I have the financial resource to retire and uh, live a modest life and be totally content with this, that's your decision. And God, God bless you for the opportunity to do that. Mm. Um, I don't think there's any requirement that someone mm. go out and try and have a big objective, like build a billion dollar company mm. or mm. save children or all these other things. That's a choice. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's a process that we have not been taught how to do. Mm. Yeah. Very few of us in our educational experiences, our backgrounds have been asked this question or given the tools to ask this question, what should I be doing and why? Yeah. Most of our educational experiences, Gaurav, were given a syllabus and were said, you're going to read these things and attend these lectures and do these projects. And if you do well, you get a, a, a high mark. If you don't, you get a low mark and you move on to the next. And we're going to give you another syllabus. And then you get out of school yeah. and you get your first job. And usually it's, it's fairly limited. And you're said, here are the things you need to do. Get better at these things. And you get to 30, 35, 40, 45 years old, and you look back and say, wait a minute, what treadmill have I been on? Ah. And why? I mean, even if it went well, even if it went really well, and I'm excited mm. and enthused and I find this interesting, why is this the path I've taken? Precisely, precisely. Most of us may not have an answer to that. You know, you've been talking about what and why, what am I doing and why am I doing that? Yes. Again, another question coming to me is that, what is more important for us to identify the goals first or the purpose first? Oh, I think that's iterative. Now, intellectually, it would make mm. sense to define purpose first. Yeah. What what change mm. am I trying to rot in the world? Why do I exist? Mm. What is the motivating objective of some sort? And then underneath that, mm. what are the things I might pursue in order to try and support that purpose? Yeah. So the way I think about this, and there are other people with different definitions, this is just the way that I mm. frame these questions, is purpose is why, mm. and uh, vision, which is different than purpose, and people mix these up all the time. Vision is what world do I want to see in the future? Mm. What outcomes, what kind of situation, what do I project into the future. That's my vision for my company, or that's mm. my vision for my yeah. career, my family, whatever it is. Purpose is why I'm doing all this stuff. The vision is what do I want to see manifest mm. in the future? And then yeah. missions. And again, other people have different definitions. I use the definition of mission that I learned from the military. I haven't served in the military, but I have many friends who have, and I have great mm. love and mm. respect for their sense of mission and purpose. When they say missions, they mean objectives. So everyone from the new private on the line all the way up to the to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff 
or the president of the United States or the, uh, or the leadership of the Indian military, for instance, everyone in that hierarchy has missions. And hopefully the missions of the privates roll up to the corporals, roll up to the, uh, the, the lieutenants and captains and all the way up to the generals mm -hmm. and eventually to the civilian, hopefully civilian leadership. Or Makes those sense. Are missions. So Makes purpose sense. is the high level why. Yeah. And then vision. Vision is the thing I'd like to create in the future. That's projecting into the future. And, then the and missions are things I'm going to go out and try and do that yeah. support my advance toward that mm. purpose. Does that mm. make sense? It is. It does. It does. So, Robert, coming back to the question that I asked you, I do understand that unless I have a purpose, anything that I do might not provide me a sense of I don't know, fulfillment, and yet we can have a life or fulfillment without the purpose. Now, you know, when I know that living a life with purpose is going to bring to me some kind of fulfillment, contentment, happiness, satisfaction, the deepest level satisfaction, and yet, and yet, we continue to be on that treadmill. What do you think? What are those hindrances that come in between? They could be self-created. It could be the societal norms, the expectations that society might have. I don't know. Yeah. Well, look, I think uh, as a practical matter, everyone in the universe has a purpose, whether they've thought about it or not. Hmm it might not be readily apparent to them if they've never thought about it. Um, it could be more narrow and limited in short term. Mm. And so what I'm proposing and others who practice this, this effort of purpose is become deliberate about it. Uh, you don't have to, that's up to you. That's a personal decision. But mm. if you become more deliberate about thinking it through, it might help you define your paths better. Mm. Now, in terms of st what's standing in the way, if you don't know where you're going, all paths lead there. Yeah. So as a first start, just start thinking about it. Le le define the questions. Don't worry about having the answers at the beginning because mm. you probably won't. Um, come up with the, the questions you're trying to address. And then you're much more likely to find clues in your everyday life and your career in, in the universe. You'll start to see answers to some of those questions and it will help you give you a greater... Uh, orientation toward purpose. Mm. Now, after you've defined purpose, if you actually commit to it, um, one of the great benefit that it provides, again, if you're actually committed to it, one of the great benefits it provides is the ability to say no to things with mm. greater confidence. So I'll just give you an example from my own experience. Um, I've been exploring this notion of purpose. It's not central to my uh, to my career, by the way, but it's essential to yeah. my career and my work. Do you see the difference? It's not my focus of my career and work, but it is essential to it. So I've been looking at this for probably 15 years, but only mm. in 2017, 18, did I finally sit down and say, you know what? I need to redraw my purpose for the next phase of my life. Mm. And I spent some, some real time on this and the pivotal context, by the way, and a, uh, a recommendation, Gaurav, for everyone with us is find a different context. Mm. You're going when you're ready to really get serious about exploring your purpose for the next phase of your life, go somewhere different, be in a different milieu or a different environment to move your your mind in different directions. So for me that was a visit to Bhutan. And I've been to Bhutan four times. I'm going back again uh, later this year. Uh, it's one of my favorite places to visit in the world. And I was with a company I invested in, I'm on the board of called Abroad, abroad.io. Um, we're a very high level human transformation coaching uh, mm. group for top executives, significant entrepreneurs, et cetera. And we happen to take a small group to Bhutan every year to explore compassion and mm. ancient wisdom and bring it into the modern world. And part of my role in that trip in 2018 in late 2018 was, I'm going to use this opportunity to explore and hone my own purpose statement. Mm. 
So the punchline is the purpose statement that came out of that experience and months of thinking and iteration was, I help people envision the future and find their places within it. Mm. I help people Beautiful. envision the future and find their places within it. Now, what has that done for me? Well, it gives me a way to say, these are the things that are important to me professionally. Mm. And there are a lot of things like, like maybe you, Gaurav, and many of your listeners, I find lots of stuff interesting. Honestly, yeah. if it's related to innovation in some way, and there's a lot of cool stuff out there, I'm, I'm very interested. And so um, I, I have opportunities to, to work on things, to work with teams, to build stuff all the time. And one of my problems was it was hard for me to say no. Yeah, I can now, so much relate to you. <laughs> I'm sure many of your listeners can relate quite well yeah. to this as well, because they're that kind of person. They're curious, yes, they're seeking, they're interested in this kind of a conversation. And so they're naturally attracted to really exciting, interesting things. And they're all mm. over the place. But one of the great things that happened from having this clarity of purpose was mm. since then, it's made it easier to say no to things that maybe are interesting. Maybe even I make some money doing them, mm. but they don't fit within that purpose. Now, yeah. Gaurav, it doesn't mean I won't do any of them. There have been a couple exceptions for various reasons, but it has made it easier for me to say no to things that I might be interested in just because I can then focus on the things that do advance this purpose in the world. Yeah. And yeah. I can become uh, the, the energy I focus, my attention in the world becomes increasingly focused on this question of helping people envision the future and finding their places within it. And I find when I'm doing that, the more time I spend on those activities, they yeah. reinforce each other. They accelerate each other. So when you reached out to me, Gaurav, and we had not met before that, and you said, I have this podcast, I took a look at it, and I said, you know what, I think that Gaurav's interests are aligned with mine. Mm. And I think that his audience and his mission objectives are aligned with this one. So I'm going to reach, I'm going I'm to respond. You know, as a friend of mine, he used to tell me that unless you know what to say yes to, unless you know what to stand for, you will fall for everything. Yeah, that's right. And it stayed with me. And since yeah. we are talking about right now purpose, unless I know what my purpose is, I will start playing too thin in my life. And I have done that mistake in the past. And I yeah. continue to do that. And today, only in the year 2015, 16, that's where I came up with my purpose statement. And I said, my purpose statement is, to hold the space for others with compassion, where they can live their life from a space of self-awareness, self-acceptance, joy, courage, possibilities, and shukrana. Now, as you mentioned, Robert, it's an iterative process. And at, in different phases of your life, you would come across a different purpose. And you will continue to march in that direction. And that's when, if only you can find a vision for yourself, that that's the kind of world that I would like to create for myself. This is what I would like to create for myself. Only yeah. then we'll be able to integrate the purpose and the vision together. Robert, you have been an expert on innovation. And if you ask me, in most of the organizations that we work with today, and primarily the C-suite executives and the C-suite minus one, yeah, most of the organizations will tell you that we are looking forward to have purpose-led leaders who can continue to innovate to come up with new services, new products, new ways of serving our customers. How can we bring in that mindset of innovation in today's leaders? Well, that's a big question. Um, a few things. Uh, one, one thing that's essential is when I meet a company, uh, I'm trying to figure out which of three kind, and there are three kinds and the rubric of strategy, okay? And then this is related to innovation, so I'll come back to that. There are three kinds of companies when it comes to strategy. One is the leadership has a strategy. They actually have a strategy. It's, you know, maybe it's a pretty good strategy, and they're trying to figure out how to manifest it in the world. Always iterating, trying to make it better, but they, they have a strategy, and they're just trying to make it work in the world. A second kind is they don't really have a strategy and they know they don't really have a strategy and they're eager to try and figure that out, okay? And the third kind, and you know where I'm going with this, 
The third kind is a company that leadership thinks they have a strategy, but they don't. And these are three very different situations and they have to be handled differently. The hardest one is obviously the third one, which is leadership thinks they have a strategy, but they don't have a strategy. What do I mean by this? I'll, to, to simplify the notion, if you look at your company and you've got a, a three-year strategy, for instance, but it's really just an operating plan extrapolated out three years, that's not a strategy. That's an operating plan. Now, there's nothing wrong with an operating plan. Every company needs an operating plan. But an operating plan extrapolated out three or four or five years is not a strategy. And so strategy is, what are you trying to build in the future? What are your vision? What is your vision in the future? Why is that your vision? That's purpose. So purpose, vision, and the mission objectives. Purpose is, why are you working so hard? What kind of value are you trying to create in the world? What do you support providing for your customers to make their lives better, et cetera, et cetera? And then the vision is, what kind of company do you want to create in the future? And then the strategy is, how do we most effectively get there? And that will change over time because the realities change. Com competition changes, technology changes, you, you learn new things. Mm. So it's an iterative process that never ends. But having that vision for the future and asking how do we most effectively get there and remain competitive and have a competitive advantages, uh, th that's a strategy. Mm. Not how do we mo uh, modestly improve our operating performance every year, doing the same thing we've been doing for the last two mm. decades. That's not a strategy. Yeah, yeah. So Robert, in your experience, people who truly innovate, and you have worked with entrepreneurs who are doing work in the space of, in the space, right? People who are uh, doing deep work in the space of medical sciences. What, according to you, differentiates people who are truly innovators from other people who continue yeah. to add more features. They might not be able to bring in novelty in a new product or service. They'll just continue to bring in more features. Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, let me let me paraphrase Forrest Gump. Uh, innovation is in it as innovation does. So if someone or a company or an organization over time consistently creates new value, significant new value, differentiated value, then over, over time, then, then you know that person or that organization is being innovative. Uh, they've exhibited it. Now, how, how do you, what's different about the people who are consistently innovative or significantly innovative compared to most, most people? Um, I would start Gaurav, by defining what what sector or realm of life you're in, in the sense of, am I a researcher at a university trying to understand the foundational reality of the universe and put it into math? And I, am I an independent entrepreneur attempting to build a transformative company that changes an entire marketplace? Am I an executive at a large established enterprise. These are all three very different, and there are other examples too, but these are all three very different situations. And innovation means something very different for someone who's trying to win a Nobel Prize in physics than it does for someone who's leading a billion dollar company or someone who's trying to build a startup. And these are different skill sets, different capabilities. But one thing that unify, unifies everyone that I've seen that has been extraordinarily successful at innovation on an ongoing basis and the commercial side. It's, it's a little different in the university and academic side, but it's true in all these spaces, all innovation is political. Now this is, it, this manifests differently in a small startup than it does in a big corporation, than it does in a government organization, but all innovation is political. Yeah. So tell me about that. What does that mean? All innovations are political. What does that mean? Right. So um, a lot of people, when they think about innovation, they think about technology, products, coming up with new services, maybe new features, like you mentioned, and it's kind of incremental, or even if it's a big change. And they focus on the product. Maybe if you're doing it well, you're focusing on what the customer actually is going to want, right? And that's essential. But meanwhile, if you're focused only on creating the greatest new thing and solving the customer's problem, hopefully you are, it's 
the political stuff going on in the background that can rise up and destroy your program. And unless you pay very close attention to those political dynamics and you manage them over time as assertively as you would manage the development of your product or your technology, then you're far more likely to fail. And I've seen this over and over again. So it, Gara venture capitalists for many decades have identified four kinds of project uncertainty. You can call it risk, and, and there's a difference between uncertainty and risk, but let's ignore that for now. These, these four kinds of project uncertainties are technology, which is basically, will it work? Market, will people buy it? And that could include things like regulation, for instance, because if the government says it's illegal, then you know, unless you're breaking the law, no one's going to buy it, right? So technology, market, financial uncertainties, financial risk. We all know what that is, right? How much money do you have at risk? blah, blah, blah. But the fourth one is organizational uncertainty or organizational risk. And this is the one people don't spend enough time paying attention to, mm. especially if you're at a big company where you're just focused on your work to try and develop a great product and serve the customer. But meanwhile, there are all these things going on in the, in, in the company that might have nothing to do with how great your project is. Mm. But if the political realities shift, your project might be canceled. You might be you might be fired or sent you know sent on your way, um, and and people usually it's not because they're being evil. Sometimes usually it's not because they're being evil. They they have their own priorities mm -hmm. and they're they're jostling for limited resources and attention, etc. So what I've found is great innovators tend to be attuned to the human dynamics. Mm. So in addition to having a great Gantt chart for your technology product development plan, which everybody does that, right? Everybody creates a plan with milestones, hopefully, you know, but few people do an organizational engagement plan. Mm. How and when do we talk to the right people at the right time? How and when yeah. do we bring people in? How do we, how do we generate human intelligence, human, the intelligence community or, or military about mm. what all the executives think about what it is we're doing? Do they care? Uh, are they, are, do they act like they're supportive, but they're not really supportive? Yeah. So these are all political factors that a lot of innovators miss. Yeah. And those are the most dangerous. And that is where they fail. You know, I just uh, love it. I think it's, it's, it's pure gold when you said that great innovators are attuned to human dynamics. I never yes. thought about that as much. And as it's I not just the design, like human factors design. That's really important. But yeah. it's about the dynamics of bringing a project to fruition yeah. and all of the political human factors, interactions, Beautiful. relationships, budget allocations, all these things that occur that mm. have to occur to enable that vision to live in the world. Yeah. I think um, our listeners are going to love what you just shared with us, Robert. When you said that most of the leaders, we don't even give our attention to what are the uncertainties and the risks that we've been dealing with. The uncertainties in the domain of technology, the technology going to work for, for us, with us. Uh, how is market going to respond to the new product or the services that we are bringing um, to this world? How are financials going to play, right? What are the dynamics, the financial dynamics that's going to play and the uncertainty in the organization? And unless we can bring in these complete uh, four dimensions of uncertainty uh, in the picture, we would not be able to produce a, a blockbuster, right? That would have yeah. the huge collection on the box office. So, Robert, you are working on something that you spoke about last time as well called proximity. So where is this future of technology taking us when we are talking about innovation and purpose? What are your views on this? Great. So uh, thanks, Gaurav. You're, you mentioned the concept of proximity, which is the yeah. title of a book I have coming out from Columbia Business School Publishing in May, uh, co-authored with Kaihan Krippendorf, uh, a good friend and, and, and innovation strategist. Uh, and what we've done is we asked the question, I started in 2014. I asked the question, are there common underlying dynamics that digital technologies drive in the economy that can give us foresight as to where industries are going? And what I fairly quickly figured out is the first part's not going to surprise your listeners, but it's the implication that almost no one has noticed. So the first part is 
digital technologies of all sorts. So this could be artificial intelligence, that could be internet of things, blockchain, could be rooftop solar or 3D printing, uh, which are digitally enabled. All kinds of digital and digitally enabled technologies allow us to compress capabilities in smaller and smaller packages yes. and distribute them all over the economy ever closer to each moment in time and space. So again, it could be a 3D printing machine. Mm. It could be an app on your mobile device. It could be AI, you know, uh, chat GPT is a perfect example. Uh, within a matter of seconds, I can have an essay. Mm. It might not be the right essay, but I can have an essay written in a matter mm. of seconds. So mm. this is all compressing capabilities in smaller and smaller packages, distributing them all over the economy, ever closer to each moment in time and space. And here's the implication, and this is the punchline. This is proximity. Digital technologies push the production and provision of value ever closer to the moment of actual demand in time and space. Hmm. Uh, let me say this again. Yeah. Digital technologies push the production and provision of value, in other words, products, services, and experiences, yeah. But I say value because your customers don't care about your products. They care about the value they get. Digital technologies push the production and provision of value ever closer to the moment of actual demand in time and space. Hmm. Now, Gaurav, when I first started talking about this publicly in 2015, 16, people would say, oh, he means better supply chain management. And I would just go, oh, my God. Uh that's such a small piece. What they're yeah. doing is they're taking the new technology and trying to make small changes to the existing model. Mm. That's not what I'm saying. That's nice, but that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is literally build technology platforms and business models that incentivize you to wait, to procrastinate until there's an actual customer for, or user for a specific product, service, or experience, and then produce and provide it co-terminus co-located with that individual and that's where every industry is going mm. for the rest of our careers mm. and in the book proximity we look at we go deep on what proximity means and how we understand it mm. there's a big distinction between production and provision those are handled differently mm. yeah. and time and space handled differently and then we look at a whole range of industries uh, how we work how we eat how we power how we create and produce, how we prevent and cure, and how we defend. Yeah. And then in the final chapter, in the concluding chapter, we look at the two horizons of humanity in the 21st century. And mm. these are virtual reality and space. Wow. And part of the reason we know that every industry is going in this direction of proximity for the rest of our careers mm. is that both of the new horizons, space and, and virtual reality, are 100% proximate. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by this? Um, well, in uh, before COVID, I was explaining proximity to a good friend of mine, a member of TWIN. This logo mm -hmm. is the World Innovation Network or TWIN. And Dorit Denobiel. And Dorit is a professor at, of medicine, uh, at biology at Baylor, and she runs the grant program for NASA for research in space health. Mm -hmm. So their mission objective is how do we help humans to survive in space for many months at a time? Hmm. When, I, when I was explaining proximity, she said, oh, my gosh, Rob, it just occurred to me, every dollar we're spending to support research humans in space is to drive proximity. Yeah. Why is that? Because when you're on a spaceship for nine months to Mars, you've only got what's on the spaceship. So yeah. absolutely everything you need to do must be proximate. Yeah. And then furthermore, virtual reality as it gets better and better and experienced more comprehensively, you'll be able to have in the future, not yet, but five years, 10 years, 20 years, you'll be able to have more and more comprehensive experiences of anything, anywhere, at any time. And that is by definition proximity. Mm -hmm. So every industry is going there this year, maybe have a focused conversation about proximity, what it means, and how we absolutely. Build it. I think we should bring you again, uh, would be an absolute delight and a pleasure, Rob to have you get deeper and, um, you know, sh elucidate our audience on the concept of proximity that you're working on. And I'm personally, I've been intrigued by when you said that the two horizons of humanity in 21st century is space and virtual reality. Yeah, because we haven't experienced either one before. Not, I mean, a little bit on the moon, but really yeah. not much. Yeah. Super, Rob, thank you so much and uh, loved having you on the very first podcast of the year 2024. 
I think I could not ask for anything more when we spoke about innovation, we spoke about purpose, and of course, what people can expect in the years to come. So it just gives them a glimpse of where we are heading towards in the year 2024 and this beautiful next decade. Robert, thank you so much. Such a pleasure having you. Thank you, Gaurav, and blessings and great thanks for your mission and purpose. I think uh, it will make the world better. Thank you so much. Thank you.